to have you back for another lunch and listen and it's such a pleasure today to welcome julie to this episode that was beautiful playing julie welcome hi thank you it's great to be here <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you again yes That's one of the great benefits is actually being able to see our musicians week uh, every week right i know well we miss seeing everybody uh, live but this is a a a nice alternative in the in the meantime. <laughs> so um, I already have several questions, but let's start with the harp. It's an instrument that is so beautiful to look at and so beautiful to listen to. Um, and you know, there is a principal harp maker in this country, uh, Lyman Healy. You're a you're a privileged artist in that, and you've been showcased with a with a solo not so long ago with a solo recital. Can you talk a little bit about the the history of harp making and the, your harp, et cetera? Sure. Um, harps are obviously a very, very ancient instrument. They've been around before most of the other instruments were even created, kind of um, uh, being created themselves on accident through a bow and arrow of sorts. But um, the concert grand harp that we mainly see in an orchestra today was primarily developed in the early 1800s um, through development, um, trying to create a way to play more chromatic music, more, more pieces that um, uh, weren't limited to minimal accidentals and minimal changes in the pitches. So there was um, a, a, a heart maker that developed um, the pedaling system and uh, first it was just to change each string by one half of a, a step. And then there was further development later on through um, Sebastian Erard and the Pleyel companies. They kind of had a, a rivalry where they um, uh, tried to make the best chromatic harp instrument for harpists to use to be able to play a, a great deal of more repertoire and more complicated repertoire. Um, 
it's funny, a side story on that is that the WC dances and Ravel's introduction in Allegro were kind of the competition pieces used to feature these two um, systems of harp making that um, eventually, you know, one of them won out, which is our double action chromatic harp, which is what we see today. So um, the, the original development of the pedal harp system really began in early 1800s, but then um, really became more perfected in the early 1900s. So um, from that, Line and Healy Harps in Chicago um, was originally a, a piano maker. They, they made pianos and multiple instruments, but um, through uh, the, the popularity of harps growing at that time and the development of um, the, the double action chromatic harp, the, the owners then took this manufacturing um, idea and wanted to perfect it. It was around, um, if I know my dates more <laughs> accurately, it was around, I think the early you know, 1920s or so when they really started to focus on making just harps. They left all the piano manufacturing and other musical instruments aside. And the Line and Healy Harp Factory then has really become um, the premier, one of the premier harp manufacturers in the world. Um, there are a few others, but um, my, my, my preference is to Line and Healy Harps because of their um, really authentic tone quality. Um, they have a, a more of a, a, dare I say, lighter wood um, thickness so that the tone itself on the instrument really can speak beautifully on the instrument and um, uh, they yeah they're just they're just really um, beautifully crafted instruments and um, just my 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 go-to for whenever I can have a harp to choose from so the orchestra's harp then is a line and healy harp and um, it is called a Salzedo model, and it was designed after Carlos Salzedo, who was a very, um, well, he, he basically modernized the harp into the 20th century. Uh, he was the principal harpist for the Metropolitan Opera. He taught at the Curtis Institute of Music, or Curtis um, School, and um, he really modernized the instrument to be a solo instrument, to be out in front of the orchestra, to be um, not just kind of pushed in the back of the stage and, and doing fluffy, fluffy things. Um, so he was really a, 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 a wave maker in the harp world and the music world and had a lot of um, very uh, influential friends and uh, colleagues that um, really inspired his new way of playing, his technique, his compositional style. And um, so, all of that being said, we have a harp that's named after him, and it's uh, Art Deco in style. And um, what I love about the Salzedo model of, the, of harps is that it really, it projects very clearly. It has a beautiful tone, and especially our orchestra's harp is just magnificent. The tone quality of the instrument is, is really spectacular, but um, it also really can showcase the colors of the harp, by projecting in a, in a larger hall and really being um, a, a voice that can be heard amongst the orchestra. So, so someone you know, asked, that was, about, <laughs> that was great. No, that was terrific. And somebody asked about the colors of the strings of the harp. Yes, you... those are important. <laughs> um, there are, um, yes, so the colors uh, denote where, which, which string I need to play. So all of the red strings are C's and all of the the black strings are F's and then I just know the rest of the scale from there so um, so the rest of them are typically just clear or white um, and um, yeah that's really how we tell where we're going so we need those colors <laughs> when you were when you first started and you started when you were I started the harp when I was 11 mm -hmm. you don't start on a pedal harp Typically not, um, depending on this, your size, and I'm not the tallest of all people, so um, a pedal harp was kind of out of my reach 
no pun intended, but that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. um, I started on an instrument that had levers instead. So a lot of, there are a lot of options when it comes to harp, there are a lot of sizes. So um, a lot of younger students begin on an instrument that's just simpler. It, it doesn't have the pedals to complicate the, the harmonic changes, the chromatic changes. And um, instead though, it has one lever at the top of each string and that's how you adjust the pitch of that particular string. Uh, you're, you're then limited to your repertoire and what you can, how, how advanced you can play, how advanced of music you can play. But it's a, it's a great way to start um, younger students or students that may not have had any musical background or piano training or something like that. So, and I've heard you play piano. You're a fine pianist as well. I did. I did play piano for about 15 years before I focused on the harp in college. So yeah, I was, um, I, I, my life trajectory could have been very different if I would have become a piano major in college, but I'm glad I chose the harp. <laughs> but the piano must influence. I mean, that must oh, have yeah. because you were learning them simultaneously. Definitely. Definitely. It was a, um, you know, playing them both side by side when I was younger was very challenging. Um, the piano itself, you know, you, everything is presented. You've got all your keys. <laughs> it's, it's right there. You just choose the right one to play and you're good to go. Um, it was challenging on the harp, though, because you have to conceptualize everything before you're playing. So you have to think ahead in every sort of way before you actually need it. So um, that goes from placing your fingers onto the right string to be prepared for the patterns or chords or whatever you need ahead of time. Um, and also when it comes to the pedaling, you have to know in advance, okay, I'm going to need an A flat and D flat in order to play this, you know, chord in, in D flat major or something. So you have to, you have to know what you're doing in advance. And it was, it was harder to, it was harder to go back and forth between the instruments. And once I really like said, okay, this is it. I'm doing this one. Um, it just becomes more a part of you and um, it, the performing, the, the, the process of pre playing, performing and internalizing all the music was, which was, was much smoother. So that was my experience at least. Maybe that's not the case for, <laughs> for everybody, but it was, um, yeah, it, it was challenging, but I definitely have a lot of, um, well, still am influenced by so much piano repertoire, and um, that really plays a, a large role in in my decisions about, you know, music, how I approach it, maybe what I, the kinds of pieces that I want to adapt for the harp, and and really opening me up into a whole another another world. So I'm grateful for that time. Well, we're grateful you chose the harp as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the, you love contemporary re repertoire, obviously. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we all can think of pieces that, that we, that have so featured the harp. Um, mm -hmm. What is, what is the difference between Tchaikovsky, for instance, through Mahler, Prokofiev, et cetera? What, what, what are you asked to do as a harpist that's different in different eras of music making? Well, um, obviously Tchaikovsky wrote um, works with the harp in mind um, and really showcasing the instrument in a cadenza-like fashion. I mean, not all of the, the, the parts that we play are only, you know, there are cadenzas in there. That's not all we do, of course. But um, the writing is definitely more um, uh, um, technical in a way where we're e exposed and doing a lot of kind of arpeggiated um, exercises and um, accompanying material, but it's really, it's, it's really showcasing the, the range of the instrument in, um, in, in more uh, arpeggios and, and technical fashion like that. Um, moving onward, I think composers really decided to utilize the harp in a, a more, um, uh, in a, in a way where it can play more of a part of the character. 
it, of course it did in, in, in Tchaikovsky too, but I, I think of Mahler and, you know, there's definitely more color aspect and we're not utilized in the same way. Like the part itself, you don't see a lot of huge arpeggios in a cadenza. <laughs> um, there, it's more for coloring to um, uh, depict a certain kind of imagery or um, uh, um, experience, say. Uh, you know, in, in Mahler one, we've got like the cowbells and, and we've, we're the bell tones that accompany what's going on in the, in the story, in the, in the symphony. So it's, it's not the same type of writing. It's, we're used in a way where we can um, use our instrument in a kind of a more percussive way, but really bringing out still our unique color um, from the instrument. Um, I think looking at, at composition, symphonic compositions beyond that, it's, um, we almost go even more to the percussive side. You know, uh, there's, there's a lot of, like for Stravinsky say, you know, we we're not really, again, not utilized with the same techniques, but um, really expanding the, 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 no. the patterns that are used into the, into the score, into our parts. Um, and I don't know, it's, it just kind of taking a more modern take on it. So um, all of the writing is, is challenging in its own way. And um, I'm, I'm obviously looking forward to when we get to play it again. <laughs> so. Yes, indeed. I, um, I imagine there are composers who understood the difficulty of certain passages more than others, or some that it's somewhat uncomfortable, and others that really figured out how to make the best use of it, right? I think so. I think they probably also had colleagues that could help them out in figuring that out too, you know? Um, and I do have to say with what you said, Tchaikovsky knew how to write for the harp. He absolutely did. But at the same time, it is very typical for harpists to adapt the writing to be even more playable. Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, the Nutcracker cadenza is typically not played as written in the score. It's um, both hands are actually in contrary mo motion um, at the same time with, with constant 16th notes, but we don't actually play it that way. And it's, we adapt and, and, and try to make it sound, dare I say better, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yes, I think, a lot of composers did have a grasp and do have a grasp for what the harp is capable of doing. And then others, um, they're, they're just using it, I guess, in simpler ways for color. So. So is there a piece or pieces, is there a composer um, either as a soloist or a member of the orchestra that you've just been dying to play that we haven't, we haven't done yet? You know, What's on your wish list? Oh goodness. Um, not not one particular piece comes to mind necessarily, but I would love to do, I'd love to do more Strauss and Wagner. I'd love to do more, more Mahler. I mean, you can't really get enough of those, but we get to sink our teeth into, to, you know, those, those composers that really wrote a lot of notes for us. And that's always fun to do. So, um, yeah, we haven't, we don't do a, a lot of Wagner. So I no, think, I think that would be really fun. Um, and we, we, you know, we've done some Strauss in the past, but there's always more to tackle, I think, but, um, I can yeah. reassure you that our music director, Raphael Payari, can't wait to do Wagner with the orchestra. Excellent. I'm <laughs> looking forward to it. <laughs> and one thing that will make it easier is that the size of the stage at the show will very, very easily accommodate the extra forces needed for Excellent. many of those Wagner works. So, yeah, you know we got to have, we got to have the right space for big works like that. So we're, we're getting there. <laughs> we're on our way. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the, another question, do you bring your own instrument to the concert hall or for concerts or do you use the symphonies? You, you sort of alluded to that, but. Right. Yes. Um, we, I am very grateful that the orchestra owns a harp. So uh, 
that happened just a couple of years after I started with, with the orchestra. And that was, gosh, I think it, I started in 2007. So I think we got an instrument um, 2008 or nine. It was just like my second season in the course of that season. So um, again, it's a, it's a beautiful instrument. It's perfect for our orchestra and um, well taken care of. So it will last a long time. <laughs> So. Certainly part of being a harpist, first of all, you're the first to arrive at the hall because you have to tune. You're the yes. first on the stage. Yes, I'm always, I'm always bugging people to let me have some stage time before lectures. <laughs> like, please, I need this. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's part of the job. You just kind of have to come early, tune, and bring a book and wait. So. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, you know, you, you play all over. I mean, you also always have to have the appropriate vehicle to take that harp with you and haul it around. It's, it is a, a, an exercise routine in and of itself. <laughs> right, right. It's a lifestyle choice. It's not just, oh, I'm going to play the harp and just, you know, that's kind of a side gig. It's like, you have to sign up for all of it you have to sign up for the minivan or the station wagon you have to sign up for oh gosh the extra space in your home to house the instruments and the supplies and everything. yeah it's who knew you just go for it <laughs> how often do you have to change the strings of a harp um it depends so um you don't necessarily have to change them all the time they they may of course, just break on their own, and that's due to humidity and um, changes in temperature. But for best sound, it's best to change. It's pr the bass wires you want to change once a year um, for the the brightness in the in the bass register. Um, the rest of them, the middle octaves, uh, the middle register, you can probably get by for like two years two or so, and then the top ones you do want to change a little bit more frequent, frequently, but they also break more frequently too. So you really also, you kind of have to look for how much the pedaling um, system has worn the string down. And then that can be really a, a, a trigger to know if you should change it because it affects the pitch very easily. Um, and then sometimes strings just go out of, out of, kind of they become warped in one way or another so you look for those clues and then you change accordingly but the the base wires you do want to change once a year for a an active um professional harpist and that's a good kind of rule of thumb to remember and how many strings are there on a harp i should know that answer maybe <laughs> you want to make it a guess oh <laughs> well there are 82 notes on a piano so it's less than that Definitely less than that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your guess? That's a very good guess. <laughs> <laughs> there are 47, 47 uh, strings. I almost said 42, yeah. so not so, not yeah. so far off. Wow. That's a full, full size concert grand. Um, there are, you know, there are semi concert grand harps with 46, or there could be instruments with 40, uh, 42, 43. Um, those are the pedal size. Um, pedal pedal harp sizes um, and then there are smaller instruments with 30 strings and you know 20 strings but the full size harp has 47 strings speaking of small size harps I do remember that when your daughter Samantha was born you got a little pink harp yes <laughs> yeah that was a gift from Line and Healy <laughs> it was a surprise and actually my son just pulled it out Yesterday, last night, he, he saw it in my studio and we were out in the, the main room and he's like, I want to play the harp. And so Samantha lifted it up. It's lightweight, but she lifted it up, brought it up to the middle room and then brought the bench. And so my son, Henry, started playing it and then he was like, you should dance. And so we <laughs> have a video of them playing and dancing. It was pretty oh. cute. <laughs> yeah, so but no cute. official lessons at this point. It's a little too early for her on the harp, but... Well, it just says so much about the family of Lion and Healy, and I, I was always touched by your story of that gift. And yes, yeah, and it was really special. How valued you are in that. <laughs> um, 
Somebody else asked another question. What about your fingers? Is it like a guitar? Is it, do you have to just really toughen them up? You do. Um, so we don't use our fingernails um, ever to play unless it's a specific color or a direction from a, the composer. Um, so it does require building up the, the um, callus on your fingers, on your fingertips in order to play um, you know, a longer period of time. And that takes, that takes a long time to develop that. Um, if you happen to take some time off a couple of weeks or, you know, even a week, it can, it can make a huge difference in your, in your finger endurance. Um, it, 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 it really does create um, either like a blister and that, you know, even if that kind of heals on its own, it, it affects the sound a great deal. So, um, the finger conditioning part of being a harpist is kind of a, a trial and error process, but, um, but definitely playing on a regular basis is certainly helpful, helpful. <laughs> and lots of lotion. <laughs> yeah. I seem to remember if my memory is correct, that your teacher came not long after I got here and played, was it Hinastera? She did. Mm -hmm. She did the Hinastera harp concerto. And she was a great mentor of yours. Yes, yes, absolutely. I studied with her for six years at the Cleveland Institute of Music. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we still keep in touch regularly today. And um, yeah, definitely a strong influence in my playing and direction and um, um, yeah, career. So, yeah, I re remember that being a nice and kind of homecoming week. So, yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> So um, before we close, maybe just a few words about, I mean, you've been in this orchestra 13 years. I know. It's crazy. And I know how <laughs> much you miss your colleagues. Um, I think understanding that connection between you and your fellow musicians, um, I think has been um, illuminating for all of us as we are in this period of time where you can't play together. And kind of how are you working that through, what does that feel like for you? Well, it's, um, it's definitely a gap in my emotional and artistic um, life, you know? I mean, there's, there's a lot of, um, over the course of time, you just develop that extended family and those relationships and the, and the connection. And this has definitely been a challenging time to um, adapt to what's missing and being creative in ways where you can fulfill that artistic need and, um, and connection. So um, it's not the easiest to continue to play with each other over Zoom or anything that doesn't really, really work so well. Um, but there are ways to still stay connected and still stay active artistically. And I think that's just been um, something that we're all trying to figure out in our own way. Uh, for me, I have, um, I've been really trying to pursue like artistically the, the, the repertoire and the pieces and what in the kind of the projects that I had unintentionally had to put on the side burner for whatever reason, life or work or whatever that is. Um, so that's been really enjoyable to kind of bring those um, projects back to the forefront and really pursue them in ways that um, uh, I may not have had the time before. Um, and I've been trying to reach out to a lot of um, younger harpists in ways where I can be more of a, of a mentor in their career development and their um, journey to, to acquire a job of, of, of some sort on the professional level. So um, I guess, you know, as far as reaching back to our community of players, like there's, um, I'm, I'm looking at doing some trio recordings um, and some performances with my colleagues in the Myriad Trio and um, trying to pr pursue other artistic uh, projects that, you know, can keep us still motivated and still actively playing on a regular basis so that we can all be ready and 
totally ready to go the day one when we're able to come back. And I think that's the most important thing. So, yeah. Well, I definitely... it's, so, it's so important that you can sustain yourself in this time mm -hmm. uh, artistically and nurture that. And it, it's just got to be hard not to have the camaraderie. But you're right. I was going to mention Myriad Trio because I know that's also an important part of your life. Right, right. And it's, um, we're all in different places. It's not the easiest um, uh, you know, ensemble to bring together at all times, but um, trying to utilize what we can and, and still remain active and, and still progressing forward, which I think is the most important thing for any of us on, on an individual level or a, a larger ensemble level. I think it's just where we have to look forward and, and, and do what we can to be ready for the future and what's to come in all ways. We can't wait until that day comes. Yes. <laughs> I think you have some more music for us. Would you like to introduce yeah. that? Sure. Um, so the second piece I'll be playing today is um, Scherzato. Scherzato, sorry, I <laughs> mispronounced it, by Jackie Bear. And this comes from a set of his six pieces for pedal harp and written in um, 1917. Pretty sure about that date. 1916. So. Enjoy. <laughs> and thank you so much. It's so good to see you. And Absolutely. You as well. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 